Good afternoon. My name is Danielle St. Germain, and I'd like to thank you for attending my presentation, New Adversaries in the Opioid Crisis, the Nitazines. I currently work as an organic chemist in the Forensic Chemistry Division at Cayman Chemical in Ann Arbor. We recently performed a collaborative study with the Laboratory of Toxicology at Ghent University in Belgium. Today, I will give you a brief history of the chemistry behind the opioid crisis, the emergence of novel analogs, and the in vitro pharmacology of the newest class of opioids, the nitazines. Opium has been used for medicine and recreation for centuries. It's also known as milk of the poppy, as you can see here on the poppy um, pod. There's a little bit of milk coming out, sap emanating from it. Uh, the raw opium is collected from the poppy pod. It's dissolved in water, then filtered to remove the plant matter, and the liquid is heated to concentrate off the water, forming a thick paste of opium that can be smoked or formulated. Laudanum, as we know it, was formulated as an opium tincture in the 1660s and became a popular panacea for all ailments from then on. The main active ingredient in opium wasn't isolated until 1806 and was named morphine after Morpheus, the god of dreams. Due to its powerful medicinal properties for pain relief, morphine has been the target of many synthetic routes. Because of the nature of the molecule, it is incredibly costly to manufacture morphine in a the lab. There are multiple stereo centers and closed ring systems. To date, the most efficient route to uh, morphine from commercial starting materials is the rice synthesis from 1980. It takes 19 steps from commercial starting materials, and it miraculously comes out with an overall yield of 25%, which is phenomenal considering. It is much more cost effective to spend a year growing your plants, extracting the morphine from the poppy plants and purifying the extract, but that brings its own set of challenges as well. Due to the prohibitive costs associated with morphine synthesis, extraction, and purification, researchers around the globe searched for a more cost-effective synthetic alternative. Mepiridine was synthesized in 1938 by IG Farben in Germany. It was the gold standard of analgesics for the better part of a century. Paul Janssen of Janssen Pharmaceuticals, located in Belgium, hypothesized that the piperidine ring found within the core structures of mepiridine and morphine was responsible for its analgesic effects. Because of the simplicity of mepiridine, this was used as the backbone to create what would become fentanyl, a new opioid um, by Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Other notable uh, opioids include U47700 from Upjohn Company, uh, USA, AH7921 from Allen and Hanbury's UK, and MT45 from Dainapon Pharmaceutical Company in Japan. These don't have piperidine rings per se, but the structural elements of that are still present with the cyclohexyl group and nitrogens close by, as well as an aromatic group. Um, just off of the um, amine moieties. The analgesic potency of fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine and 50 times stronger than heroin, uh, making it an excellent analgesic. Fentanyl was placed under DEA Schedule II status for medicinal use in 1970. Fentanyl has higher yields, higher potency, and higher profits, and its structure is easily modified. Fentanyl is a potent analgesic, which is excellent in a clinical setting, but has serious consequences when it is abused. Abuse of opioids has steadily risen since the early 1990s. The synthesis of fentanyl takes three steps from commercial materials, and as I mentioned earlier, it's incredibly easy to modify at each turn. So in an effort to bypass DEA scheduling, analogs began to flood the market um, to keep up with the rising demand for opioids in the U.S. You can see from these DEA emerging threat reports that the number um, and variety of analogs uh, proliferated quite a bit from 2016 to 2018. Now, in the 1980s and 90s, a seized drug street sample was typically just one drug. Now, forensic scientists are seeing cocktails of multi multiple drugs in one sample, and oftentimes the user is unaware of its contents. 
This is a sample that was taken from a harm reduction testing site as recently as May of 2022. Um, these, the user will send in their samples to these harm reduction testing sites uh, and pay a fee, and then they will get a report what um, showing what uh, their drug contains. Um, and in this case, this sample contains mostly caffeine, fentanyl, and heroin. We also see cutting agents like procaine and tetracaine, um, precursors like 4-AMPP, and dyspropion 4 fluorofentanyl, as well as other um, impurities and precursors. Abuse happens when the synthetic opioid hijacks our biological opioid system. The endogenous opioid system is comprised of four main receptors, the mu opioid receptor, the delta opioid receptor, the kappa opioid receptor, and the nociceptin uh, receptor. Each of these receptors responds to endogenous opioid ligands that we produce in our bodies called the endorphins, the enkephalins, the dynorphins, and nociceptin. The endogenous opioid system works in concert to keep our bodies maintained at a healthy baseline level, preventing extreme responses to everyday stimuli. It's the reason we don't feel pain when our feet touch the ground or when we feel a splash of cold water right in the face. <laughs> the pharmacology of opioids is complex, but the dangers associated with them stem mostly from one of the four opioid receptors, a G-protein coupled receptor, which is the mu opioid receptor. The mu opioid receptor is the main culprit for most of the negative effects that come with opioid abuse because it's the most prevalent receptor in the body. It's also the uh, receptor that is responsible for acute pain relief. And in concert with all the other receptors, it's the most dangerous because it uh, stimulates the drug reward feeling and it uh, along with the delta receptor, suppresses the body's ability to detect carbon dioxide, which causes respiratory depression. As the body becomes acclimated to the synthetic alternative drug, uh, it develops a tolerance at higher doses, uh, which steadily causes the body's uh, respiratory baseline to lower, and the body gets used to uh, functioning with less and less oxygen. And when the user attempts to get clean, they go through withdrawal. They lose their high tolerance uh, as the body returns to the original respiratory set point. And once the body recovers, if the user relapses, they typically go to their uh, past dosage that they needed before they became clean, which tanks their system. They go into uh, respiratory arrest and often die of overdose unless drastic measures are taken with antagonists. Overdose isn't relegated to just the seasoned user. It can happen to anyone if they come into contact with a large enough dose of an opioid. Overdose fatalities in the United States remain steady until 2013 and then begin to rapidly escalate. Now, there are many factors that contribute to this rise in abuse and overdose deaths, and that could take up uh, a talk in and of itself, which we don't have time for today. But if you're interested in taking a deep dive into those factors, then I highly recommend reading Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opioid Epidemic by Sam Quinones. It's a compelling read, and I couldn't put it down. In response to the rapid rise in abuse and mortalities, the DEA made an unprecedented class-wide emergency scheduling of fentanyl analogs in February of 2018. Shortly after, China followed suit in May of 2019. Once the bans went into full effect, the number of fentanyl analogs seen in street samples declined. Instead, other more obscure classes of opioids from the literature began to emerge. There were the pyrrole, two amino ethanols, um, which include two fluorovimanol, the piperidine, four benzimidazolones, such as borphine, the cinnamyl piperazines, which include AP237, the thiambutines, which include piperidinol thiambutine, and finally, the two benzyl 
benzimidazoles, um, which include isodronidazine or iso, which will be the focus of this talk. Notice that the piperidine-like motif is also conserved in four of these five. You can imagine that this, if these two um, alkyl groups swung into the center, you'd have a piperidine here. We have a piperidine here and porphine, a piperazine and AP237, and a piperidine and piperidinyl thiambutene. These new opioid analogs are being trafficked as legal highs on gray marketplaces that often have legitimate forward-facing websites. Um, and in some cases, they're also being sold on Reddit and Discord sites. So why are these popular now? Uh, let's go back into the history for the answer to that question. The nidazines were developed in the 1950s by Swiss researchers at Ciba, now Novartis. In rodent bioassays, this beta diethylaminoethyl 2 benzyl benzimidazole compound showed 10% of the activity of morphine in uh, rodent bioassays. Now, that activity increased when they added a nitro group to the benzimidazole core. They also found that activity increased when they made substitutions on the benzyl group at the para and meta positions, as well as by swapping out the amine substituent on the beta um, amino ethyl chain. Multiple analogs were identified as potent MOR agonists, including the very potent adenitazine. Adenitazine is named for the ethoxy group on the 2-benzyl position and the 5-nitro substituent on the benzimidazole core. This appears to be where the nitazine name, uh, class name came from. Note that this class doesn't have the morphine-like piperidine in the structure at all. However, computational studies identified the key structural features of this class. It turns out that the diethyl amino group mimics the rings on uh, morphine and the para-ethoxy benzyl group provides hysterics and rigidity that lead to mu specificity. An overlay can show these similarities. Early animal studies show the potency of several analogs to be similar to morphine, where a 5 mg subcutaneous dose of morphine is set to 1 for antinociceptive potency comparison. Potency increased when the nitro group was added at the 5 position of the benzimidazole core. And by changing the alkoxy substituent, the potency increased exponentially, with metonidazine at 100 times uh, the potency of morphine, protonidazine at 200, isodonidazine at 500, and finally adonidazine coming in at 1,000 times more potent than morphine. In August of 2019, the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education, the CFSRE, and NMS Labs identified and characterized the first seized samples of isodronidazine, named for the isopropoxy group located on the 2-benzyl um, moiety. Two years later, eight more analogs were identified, with more to come. The isopropyl group was eventually switched out for a propoxy group for protonidazine, a fluorine for the flunidazine, a methoxy group for the metonidazine, a butoxy group for the butonidazine. Uh, etonidazine here had the um, amine swapped out for the n pyrrolidino group, making it n pyrrolidino etonidazine. Same with the piperidinyl group, forming N-piperidinyl adenidazine. And without the nitro group in the 5 position located here, the core name was conserved, adenidazine, making it etodesnidazine to indicate the lack of nitro group, as well as metodesnidazine. When a forensic scientist is trying to confirm the identification of a seized sample, they need to have high quality reference standards to compare to their drug samples. Cayman Chemical is an analytical reference standard provider. We synthesize drugs that are suspected to be trafficked, and we acquire a battery of tests to confirm the structural identity of the compound. These tests include, but are not limited to HPLC purity, FIA, and electron impact, um, 
mass spec, 1D and 2D NMR, TLC, um, IR, and melting points. We provide a confirmation of analysis with every standard so that the customer can be confident that what they are testing their sample against is exactly what we say it is. From 2019 to 2021, we synthesized 10 nitazine parent compounds and four nitazine metabolite standards. The synthesis for nitazines is pretty straightforward. It's three steps from commercially available starting materials. The first reaction is a simple amination to form the first nitro intermediate from a nitrobenzene and an ethane diamine. The nitro intermediate is then reduced by ammonium sulfide to give the second triamine, intermediate, uh, triamine intermediate, which then undergoes reductive amination conditions with a phenyl acetic acid uh, and then performs an intramolecular cyclization to form the final uh, nitazine product. And just like with fentanyl, there are multiple ways to modify these analogs by swapping out different starting materials at each step. If you want to change the benzimidazole core, you will have to change your nitrobenzene. If you want to swap out a different amine group, then you'll use a different uh, ethane diamine. And those two happen in the very first uh, step. And then if you want to switch out the uh, benzyl substituent, then you will change your phenyl acetic acid. We donated 14 standards to our collaborators at Ghent University for further characterization by HPLC DAD, LCQ TOF mass spec, GC mass spec, as well as for the pharmacological studies. Here are the 14 nitazines we sent for the Ghent, to Ghent for study. We have metonitazine, uh, etonitazine, protonitazine, and butonitazine, as well as the desnitazine counterparts of meto, eto, and isodonitazine. Uh, we sent in flunitazine and clonitazine. And we also sent in the four metabolites, which include the N-desethyl etonitazine and isodonitazine, and the five amino isodonitazine, as well as the four hydroxynitazine. Most forensic labs screen their compounds using GC mass spec. The characteristic GC mass spec fragmentation of etonitazine was postulated in 2016 in J Mass uh, International Journal of Mass Spectrometry, with the major fragment being this NN diethyl azeridinium ion at 100 mass units. We saw this fragmentation pattern in most of our samples, making it a good diagnostic peak. If a base peak of 100 shows up in an unknown sample, it is a good indicator that the scientist should screen for niazine analogs. The safe and effective handling of seized samples by forensic scientists requires solid, up-to-date pharmacological data. Other than the early animal studies from the 1950s and 60s that I described earlier, there were no recent published pharmacological data for these novel nitazine analogs. Ghent University performed two in vitro recruitment assays for mu opioid receptor activity. Remember that the mu opioid receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. When activated, opioid analgesia is thought to be mediated by the GI receptor dependent pathway in red. And they um, adverse effects that we discussed, such as the respiratory dep uh, depression, addiction, and tolerance were thought to be mediated by the beta-arrestin pathway in blue. The mini GI and uh, beta-arrestin-2 assays were used to measure the analgesia and negative potential of these novel analogs. While in vitro studies are not synonymous with in vivo studies, the in vitro studies we present may have predictive potential when it comes to the nitazine class of compounds. All 14 nitazines exhibited mu opioid receptor activity. As a reference point, I have the EC values for morphine and fentanyl located here in the upper right quadrant. Keeping in mind, it takes 385 or 338 nanomolar to elicit a response at the mu opioid receptor for morphine, while fentanyl takes 300 or requires 
34.6 nanomolar or 14.4 nanomolar to elicit the same response. Remember that low EC50 values equals higher potency, meaning that it requires less drug to elicit an effect at the receptor. Five of our nitazines tested were more potent than fentanyl, and 12 nitazines were more potent than morphine. Our in vitro assays show that etonitazine is the most potent of the nitazines in the series, uh, requiring only 0.661 nanomolar to elicit a response. Keep in mind that fentanyl takes 14.4 nanomolars in the beta arrestin um, assay to elicit the same response. Now, if you change the length of the alkyl chain, it affects the potency of the nitazines, where we see isotonitazine coming in at two times less potent than etonitazine at 1.63 nanomolar, protonitazine coming in two times less uh, potent than isotonitazine at 3.95 nanomolar, uh, metonitazine coming in another two times less potent than protonitazine at 8.14 nanomolar, and then we have butonatazine, which falls below fentanyl in potency at 36.2 nanomolar. Um, we also see the ranking of our nitazines uh, mirror those of those early animal studies, um, with etonatazine being the most potent and butonatazine being the least. The efficacies of the isotonitazine protonitazine, uh, metonitazine, all of these efficacies here uh, as a percentage of fentanyl are similar with the Emax around 100 to 110 uh, range relative to fentanyl. And the etonitazine is definitely the most efficacious compound at 134% Emax. We see the same ranking in the analgesic mini G assay showing that these are very potent uh, analgesics as well. Um, fentanyl comes in at 34.6 nanomolar, um, metonitazine coming in at 23.5 nanomolar, protonitazine at 10.4 nanomolar, isotonitazine at 3.72 nanomolar, and then etonitazine at 1.71 nanomolar. What this shows us is that the uh, shortened alkoxy tail or compact al alkoxy tail is optimal for mu opioid receptor activity, but if you lower uh, the length too much, then you drop in potency, and if you extend it too much, you uh, drop your potency as well. Halogenation in the para position on the benzyl group lowered the potency of more significantly from etonitazine being around 0.661 nanomolar. And if, when we replace the eta, um, ethoxy group with a chlorine, we see a drop to 140 nanomolar. And with fluorine, we see an even more marked drop to 377 nanomolar, which is counterintuitive because you would normally think that substituting a fluorine, um, you would expect a little bit higher binding affinity but it could also be because of size, chlorine being larger than fluorine. And as we described earlier, there seems to be a sweet spot with the ethoxy and isopropoxy group um, requiring that, that particular size. If you lower the, the size of the ethoxy group, uh, you lower potency. And if you extend that, you also lower potency. So it could just be a size issue. We also see this mirrored in our animal studies from the 1950s um, with clonitazine being about three times more potent than flunitazine. And we're getting into uh, similar uh, territory being with a morphine potency. So beta restin of the flu flunitazine is similar to morphine, whereas the uh, mini G analgesia of clonizine is more similar to morphine. The nitro group is also important for mu opioid receptor activity and activation. If we look at etonitazine and its etodesnitazine counterpart, it falls from 0.66 nanomolar to 54.9 nanomolar in the beta arrestin assay. Isotonitazine falls from 1.63 nanomolar to 34.8 nanomolar, 
and metonidazine falls from 8.14 nanomolar to 548 nanomolar. Quite a jump. Um, these compounds are still similar um, in the similar vein of fentanyl, but metodesnitazine falls even below morphine in the beta arrestin assay. We see an even more marked uh, drop in potency in the mini G analgesic um, assay with potencies dropping uh, closer to morphine in uh, potency and a huge drop from metodinitazine's 23.5 nanomolar to metodesnitazine's almost 1700 nanomolar uh, required to make a response. This is about 4.4 4 times less potent than even morphine. The most, res the most surprising result that we observed was the high potency of the desethyl metabolites of isodonitazine and uh, etonitazine. If we look at etonitazine and recall that it took 0 0.661 nanomolar to elicit a response in the beta arrestin assay, we see a drop to 1.81 nanomolar and a slight drop in efficacy from 134 to 101 Emax when this compound is metabolized to the end desethyl metabolite. Now we see the same uh, mirror happening in the mini G where the analgesic effect goes requires 1.71 nanomolar in the adenitazine and drops to 6.38 nanomolar with another drop in efficacy uh, observed here as well. These values uh, mirror more similarly the isodonitazine parent which had a 1.6 nanomolar and a 110 uh, Emax in the beta arrestin um, assay. However, when that was dealkylated, it jumped to 0.614 nanomolar um, in EC50 and a efficacy of 140, which uh, rivals even etonitazine, the most potent parent in the series. Uh, this is likely a contributing factor for the number of fatalities uh, seen in isodonitazine cases. Now we do see a marked decrease in potency when it comes to the 4-hydroxynitazine and the reduced 5-amino isodonitazine. The um, values lower to 176 and 383 um, starting to fall into the area of morphine potency. Uh, we also see the analgesic effect lowering as well. Anti-alkylation doesn't necessarily increase the more activation potential for all analogs, but we did see that in isodonitazine versus etonitazine. In summary, the uh, modifications on these nitazines is incredibly important. In some cases, we see with isodonitazine the metabolism of the amine substituent forming a more potent compound um, than the parent. Uh, and then when we remove the nitro group, we see a marked difference, uh, decrease in both efficacy and potency. Um, still a very potent compound, similar to fentanyl. Uh, if we remove the alkoxy substituent, uh, we see another marked decrease in potency and efficacy. And if we reduce the nitro group, it drops again to uh, more morphine-like levels. So all of these modifications are important for the potency at mu opioid receptors. If we look at the bigger picture and we look at our uh, graphs here, the closer the um, line is to this uh, y-axis, the more potent the compound is. Um, we see that isodonitazine is more potent than fentanyl, more potent than hydromorphone, which is more potent than morphine, uh, reflected the same in the mini-G assay. 
Uh, we did see that modifications on the alkoxy group have a market effect on potency. Uh, the sweet spot appears to be a two carbon chain for etonidazine or a three carbon chain um, more compacted for the isopropyl group as opposed to uh, the protonidazine which is less potent than the isodonidazine. Uh, halogenation at the pair position on the benzyl, benzyl substituent lowers uh, potency from isodonidazine. We see the clo and the flunidazine um, lower at lower potency. And then metabolism typically lowers potency with the 4-hydroxy nitazine and the 5-amino nitazine substituents. Um, however, we did see that the desalkylation does not necessarily appear to lower potency, and in some cases, in the case of isodonitazine, it actually increases the potency. Um, and then the 5 nitro group is also required if you remove the 5 nitro group um, or reduce it, you see a reduced potency as well. In conclusion, two benzyl benzimidazoles are a potent class of opioids that are commonly referred to as the nitazines. The simplicity of the synthesis and the structure of this class has the potential to proliferate similarly to fentanyl and its analogs. Nitazines are being trafficked on gray market places and have a high potential for harm due to their mu opioid receptor affinity. Isodonitazine has been implicated in multiple fatalities. The in vitro opioid activity of the metabolites can contribute to toxicity, increasing the harm potential. And due to the potency of this class, highly sensitive detective detection methods may be required for identification in human samples. When screening seized in a biological samples, if a base peak of 100 is encountered in electron impact mass spec, it is recommended that a screening for nitazines be performed. This study focused on the mu opioid receptor, and it should be noted that the activity at the other opioid receptors may, be, may also contribute to toxicity and activity in vivo. I'd like to take time to thank our collaborators at Kenton University for doing amazing work, um, acquiring the data and getting it out in lightning speed. We have our primary author, um, Martha van de Poot, uh, Dr. Kathleen van Utvanga, and Professor and Dr. Christoph Stove. Um, they do amazing work in the field of forensics, and the paper that we've put out has been very well received by the community. I'd also to, like to thank my co-authors, Nathan Lail, who did a lot of the synthesis along with myself on the nitazines, and Dr. Donna Iula, the VP of Forensic Chemistry at Cayman. Um, Donna's a huge champion for her people, and um, offered us this amazing collaborative opportunity. She's always looking to work with people in the forensic community and always trying to um, be of help and assistance to our customers. Um, I'd also like to thank Cayman Chemicals Forensic Chemistry Division. It's an amazing team to work with and they're always working to make research possible at every turn. As we're here for the alumni section of the ACS meeting, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize my alma mater. I completed both my undergraduate and graduate degrees here at Eastern Michigan University, and I'd like to send a warm thank you to my mentor, Dr. Harriet Lindsay. Harriet's an amazing instructor and played a large role in guiding me in my studies as well as my career, and I can honestly say I wouldn't be the chemist I am today without her mentorship. Thank you so much, Harriet. I'd also like to recognize and thank the amazing faculty at the EMU Chemistry Department. They are committed to providing not only the classroom experience, but also fostering connections with the chemistry community, as well as providing research and presentation opportunities, be it internally at the undergraduate symposium or at an ACAS meeting like this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also to my audience. I'm so sorry I can't be there to answer your questions in person, but if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out and email me at dstgermain at caymanchem.com. Thank you again, and have a glorious day.